I'm talking different kind of all the elements of the wire become different. And uh, so this is an operator you can also uh, introduce. And now you can ask, suppose that at the, at the Planck level this, this thing behaves in a very complicated way. How does it behave if you look at a million times a million times a million Planck points? Now, the whole thing will start to behave like white noise. It's very, very difficult to make any systematic description of it. Unless you use these exchange operators as fundamental observables. And in fact, you can do arithmetic there. You can do the mathematics of this thing. And say that perhaps the relevant operators at large scales are not only the operators which tell you what actually every single bit and byte is, but also how do interchange operators evolve? If I make one switch in a cellular quantum, how does that switch evolve in time? <coughs> For some reason, at large sales scales, we have been unable to make a distinction between the switch operators and those operators which simply tell you what the state of the quantum is. That is my theory of quantum mechanics, that we have lost our ability to distinguish Operators tell you what the system is, and operators tell you what it would be if you made a little change. And uh, for some reason, that I don't know why that is so, these things have become confused. Now, maybe I don't know why that is so, but I have a way of computing a cellular automaton in an abstract sense, where I make use of such operators. So is it a classical and cellular automaton? It's a classic cellular automaton, just as classic as a planetary system. I can make Earth, Mars, interchange operator, but now at the level of a cellular automaton, which is a very, very tiny switch. And um, the, the way that switch continues in space time is as important as to ask how the automaton itself evolves. And so once gonna, you do this. Are you going to find observables with eigenstates of this operator yes. as before? Yes. Okay. So your question about the complex number comes about because you can consider much, much more complicated operators like this. For instance, the rotation operator, the uh -huh. functions, and you can diagonalize it. And you can ask, how do the eigenstates of this operator evolve? Well, all atoms and particles you see are eigenstates of rotation operators. But the original automaton probably didn't know about those eigenstates. So we introduce those eigenstates as, as man-made artifacts. So the atoms are man-made artifacts because they are in the eigenstates of the rotation operator as they are eigenstates in the displacement operator, because they're super momenta, and so on. But that, those are all man-made concepts. Those eigenstates induce complex numbers all over the place. Sure. Uh, because many eigenstates have complex numbers in it. If you look at the eigenstate of the displacement operator, that's e to the i, p times and so on. So that's, so I, uh, diagonalizing mm -hmm. operators gives you the complex numbers. And uh, once you're there, you get the impression so it's not more than that in the question. The problem again just comes about because for some reason at the very microscopic scale these interchange operators are as important as operators telling you what where things are. And certainly from a mathematical point of view, it's very convenient to use these operators. And I have a way of working out a cellular automaton where I I use these operators just just as things which have more terrific computation rules all over. And get something very interesting, looks entirely from the end. So once you have these operators, the thing looks like a quantum system. So quantum mechanics can come about as an artifact. In fact, I should mention that long ago in this science, when I was still a student, uh, my friends in, in condensed metaphysics were discussing the Ising model. And they said the two-dimensional Ising model has an exact solution that has very interesting properties in statistical physics. I don't know whether everybody here knows what the Ising model is. We take a lattice, a very, very large lattice like a checkerboard, and you put pluses and minuses on the checkerboard. The checkerboard is very, very large, and you make two constraints. You say the, number, the total number of pluses is equal to the total number of minuses on a very, very large checkerboard. How do I put the pluses and minuses on it? Any way you like, but the number of pluses that is, uh, has a neighbor, uh, a minus is a neighbor, the number of, of, of links that connect a plus with a minus is also fixed. 
Now the problem is quite a bit more complicated. So we keep the number of pluses and minuses the same, and you keep the number of bonds where a plus hits a minus also fixed. Question. This, this, this check wall is a million times a million signs, two dimensional thing. How many ways can you do this? Little mathematical exercise. Do it on a piece of paper. When I was a student, I knew how to do the one dimensional part. You have pluses and minuses, one dimensional, and you ask how many spots can it, does a plus borrow to a minus, is, and these don't count because two minuses are How many ways can you do that? That's easy. That you can solve on, on the back of random block. But if, in two dimensions, it becomes very hard. And then people say it's solved. So I asked my friends, how do you solve it? And they all came with a paper by Bruegel Kaufmann, who was a student of, of Onzager. Onzager, a Norwegian physicist, had solved this problem. But he was unable to communicate to anybody how he solved it. But he had a student, and the student wrote it down. That was Bruegel Kaufmann. What she did was something amazing. And I never anybody talks about it. What she did was she turned the problem into a quantum problem. The question, as I, as I put forward to you, pluses and minuses, there's no quantum mechanics in the question anywhere. No open space, no quantum mechanics, no nothing, no complex numbers. But she used quantum mechanics to do it. She said, you have to introduce an operator, which you take a whole, uh, you, you, you open up these links, and you, you say how many pluses and minuses go through here, how many bonds are plus minus bonds, how many are plus plus bonds, and where are the pluses and minuses, and she used some very fancy mathematics, which turns out to be the mathematics of particles on a line that, that just propagates in, in this direction. And lo and behold, she used quantum field functions. The thing was equivalent to a model in the one dimension where three electrons move around from left to right and right to left. And since these electrons are free, you can solve it. And so this is an example where quantum field theory was used to solve a classical problem. It's the only non-trivial example I know. Very non-trivial. It's very hard to solve the model using other methods. It can be solved using other methods. It's very hard. And, um, uh, and the model was, the method was extremely elegant. Which I, but what I find so amazing is that you use quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, in fact, to solve such a classical question. So my belief now is that the cellular problem, the classic cellular problem, is just like that. And what we call quantum field theory today is just a fancy technique to solve a classical system. The difference this time is that we have the answer to the question. The answer to the question is quantum field theory. Here, the question was how to solve the Eisen model. But in case of quantum field theory, we don't know what the question was. We know the answer to the question. So it's like, you know, this famous quiz, you know, you have to answer, you know, what is, and so on. Uh, so uh, th that's, uh, uh, that's the situation we feel in being now. We have to, the answer to the question is quantum field theory. The question we don't know. The question is something like the cellular automaton. And uh, to me, it makes complete sense when I can call it. If so, the th nature looks very much like a cellular automaton. Presumably, the square lattice is far too easy and far too stupid to be if you represent the real world. The real world must be much smarter than that. After all, you want to reproduce general relativity, special relativity, uh, the standard model. That's not going to be a simple cellular automaton. It's going to be something much more complicated than that and much smarter than that in a sense. But we have no idea. So. Uh, I go back to the beginning of what I said, that we have to look at the physical evidence to see how to improve the standard model and hopefully make the two ends of this problem meet. Start the cell automata, start the standard model. Is that a connection? This is a big problem. I, I think many more uh, uh, generations of theoretical physics have to, to come and go for the model. <coughs> That's all. Can I ask a short question? Yes. Of course. This is for everybody around the table that is joining in and discussing. No, no. I, I think it's really fascinating. Uh, uh, and actually, it wasn't, even though I think probably philosophically we differ, I don't really care if we differ philosophically, practically, and mathematically, we converse. So, um, 
So, so these things like that, but I discussed the strategy, not yeah. measuring what's proven wrong, but how to get there. Right. So, so uh, I completely agree with what you said about getting getting complex numbers and something like quantum mechanics out of classical theories because you know, there's this old explanation that Agha Bohr thought made of why quantum mechanics, which is that we have symmetries of the system, the symmetries are continuous, and therefore their fundamental representations are complex, are unitary and we're complex numbers. And so as long as we have some kind of symmetry in the system, then we're, we're going to get complex numbers whether we want to get them or not. And here you're using the swap symmetry, which actually when you make it into a continuous symmetry, automatically induces yeah. actually the whole of This a similar symmetry uh, transformation to the one and so on. Right. And, and in fact, you, uh, do, you know, do, you know, do you know this? There's a very elegant formulation of quantum computation entirely in terms of swap operators, where you you can you can decompose. You don't have to have that dual rotations on one of Right. Well, the entire computation Yeah. So you just op you operate on the irreducible representations of the swap operator, and those become your qubits in, instead of spins. And you have know, a comment too. Okay. Yeah. Well, so so I, I, I did have a question. I have a question, which is, it's so, it's you seem to be doing something kind of which seems to me sort of funny, which is that you're taking a classical system and you're looking at it in terms of you know these group representations, but then you're saying observables somehow correspond to um, you know irreducible representation or eigenstates of these. Operators, and that seems funny because normally I think of oh, in quantum mechanics there's this funny thing where observables correspond to eigenstates, which you know Heisenberg and Schrodinger, Schrodinger told us about, and we just have to accept it. But nobody ever told me before that in a classical system that the observables correspond to eigenstates of some operator. So why why are you doing that? Well, in a classical system, just like in a quantum system, you can ask the question, what if I interchange these things? What if I interchange mass and earth? How will they evolve? Right, right. I see, so you, you're saying it, we, we ask with a particular operation, which, yes. which is like swap. And so then when you when you try to look at, at the representations, you, you look at how the thing might evolve and to understand that you have to put throughout the symmetries of this yes. system. which which are the same things, symmetries under swap are going to be the same as the symmetries under these, or, sorry, complementary to the symmetries under these unitary groups like any moment. So is that then, so, okay. Well, that makes sense, I guess. George? I have a question too, which is, I tried to read your paper on this, but I didn't have a problem. How do you account for Bell in this kind of model? Yeah, that is a very difficult question because there's a very fundamental difference in quantum systems and planetary system, which is that for some reason these operators seem to transform into each other. So time evolution, and here comes a dynamical question. So as long as you talk of things statically, I didn't say what the laws of Newton's laws are, how are Mars and Earth propagate. But um, in quantum mechanics, someone seems to start with a, a particle that's spinning in the x direction, you put it in the magnetic field, otherwise it spins in the y direction, whereas x and y do not converge. That we don't have for a planetary system. So it's not so, in a planetary system, once you know where Earth and Mars are, you never enter into a state where you are an eigenstate of the swap operator. So that's where the planetary system differs from quantum mechanics. But I think, but this is, thinking not being able to prove it, that the reason for this is complexity. That the cell of automaton is extremely complex. You might call a planetary system complex also. Maybe a global cluster of stars is more complex than a planetary system. Maybe to understand how waves propagate in a global cluster, you might want to do things like this. So, uh, you can even in, in the gravitational system create uh, states which are a little bit like the uh, swap, I mean, swap operating states, but at least states which are very far from the position I can take. Let me try with your fourth, if you don't mind. If they balance this as well as they can, so it's close to the position I can take. Then, if, if there were no disturbances from the air and vibrations, it would fall into a superposition of being here and here, which is very far from being. Uh, and that position I used to, even you know, in the, in the gravitational system, yes. especially so, in the gravitational system. 